Hi y'all, long time no see. So this is the first video of several, perhaps only two, uh, but I think it'll be more, talking about the Russia investigation, Mueller, what's going on in the Congress, and the issues that I see that I think are the important ones. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of history, so I'm not going to talk about the Mueller report all that much right now, or Mueller all that much right now. That'll come on in later videos, two of which I'm going to do today. I'll upload both two tonight. Uh, I'll make one public today, and then one will be public in about a week, and then we'll see where we are. But anyway, so I, uh, you know, the past is prologue. If you want to find out the way people are going to behave today, uh, if there's a similar example of conduct in the past, you look at that, and uh, you're very often going to do reasonably well by that metric. Not perfectly, but you'll do reasonably well, uh, particularly for political actors, because they, uh, well... For all the talk about how Donald Trump is a big fat liar, uh, I don't know all that many politicians who are particularly honest. Uh, they all kind of lie. I think what really rankles everyone uh, in the media and you know, the Democrats and whatnot with respect to Trump is that he's just a lot less subtle about it than they are. He's not at all clever about it. He just bleh, whatever he wants to say and he says it. Uh, the others put some thought into it. They try to do it really cleverly uh, to, to uh, lie to people that way. So I think... Uh, they really resent the fact that he's getting all the credit for none of the work. They do all of the hard work of finding really clever ways to, to lie, and it's not paying off for them. Uh, that includes the media and politicians. But in any event, I'm going to start here with uh, the past going back to Bill Clinton, and then I'm going to go all the way forward to today and uh, talk about that. Now, Bob Mueller was a special counsel, which is different than an independent counsel. Uh, that statute was allowed to sunset after the, uh, the abortion of justice that was done to Bill Clinton. Uh, fortunately, everyone saw the wisdom of saying, yeah, we'll just let this statute die. Uh, we won't renew the independent counsel statute because apparently all the warnings we got from people about letting out a big fat monster were true and we were just too stupid and blind and petty at the moment to notice it. But we realize it now. We'll let that thing sunset. Uh, Elena Kagan has talked about one of the greatest um, dissents in at least the modern Supreme Court history, if not the entire Supreme Court's history, is a dissent that Justice Scalia wrote in the Olson case, the, I'm sorry, yeah, Independent Counsel versus uh, Ted Olson, who was later to become the Solicitor General. And, uh, and certainly she says it's certainly uh, Nino's, Justice Scalia's best dissent. Uh, and she says, and it has been getting better every day since he wrote it. And the conventional wisdom is that uh, even though the Olson case has not been, the Morrison against Olson, has not been formally overturned, people shouldn't rely on it because the the statement of the justices about it over, over time kind of indicates that there is a majority for saying that that was wrongly decided. It was a terrible idea. Uh, the only person who was behaving reasonably during that whole litigation, other than, you know, I mean, as far as decision makers go, was Justice Scalia. And... Uh, it was just a brilliant um, dissent. If you've not read it, go read it. It's absolutely brilliant. And it sums up the un-American notion of the independent counsel. And I don't mean just that uh, it's trying to, to bleed away power from the president to control executive officials. That's bad enough. Uh, and other things. But it's the idea of having a lawyer, a dedicated prosecutor, whose only purpose in life is to pick you and follow you everywhere you go, 24 hours a day, waiting to find something to prosecute you for. And when that's not working out, to go back through your entire past, all the way back as the statutes of limitations may be for any particular kind of uh, potential crime, and uh, try to bring that up uh, just to get you. And the special counsel is not that. The special counsel is more like ordinary prosecutors in that you start with some event, and the things that you're going to do are related to the potential crime, as opposed to picking someone and saying, investigate that guy until we get him, which is what they did with Clinton. Uh, another reason I'm starting with Clinton and not Trump is because it's, uh, I'm going to be accused when I talk about, when I start defending the presidency under Donald Trump, uh, of being a Trump boy, a fan boy, whatever it is, a uh, Trump fan, I'm on the Trump train. I'm not, I didn't vote for the guy. I don't particularly like him, but that, there's not, there aren't two Article Twos in the Constitution. There's not one presidency for the guys I like and one presidency for the guys I don't like, and the presidency for the guys I don't like has a set of rules that are really not advantageous to the president, while the, the set of rules for the Article II, uh, that I for the guy I do like uh, give him all the freedom in the world. It isn't that. It's one Article II, and it, even though you will get some... Not, uh, not, not everyone's going to be happy in every election. You're going to get the guy you don't want. 
that is not an argument to say, well, let's do what we can to undermine the office. The, the, the Constitution is very, is very well written, it's very cleverly written, and it's there for a reason, and it is simply not sufficient because it is a good political gain right this second with the guy in there you don't like to start knocking things about, because eventually the guy you do like is going to get in there, and what was done to one is going to be done to the other from the other side when the roles reverse. Uh, so there's that. Now, I didn't particularly like Bill Clinton. I don't particularly like Donald Trump, but I ne or Obama for that matter. But nevertheless, uh, when, when they are using the powers of the office uh, and doing the things that presidents do in a, in a proper way, even if I don't agree with it, but nevertheless a proper and lawful way, I'm going to defend it. Even though Donald Trump makes that really difficult because, you know, he's got lageria. So, so many to, he, uh, one historian put it like this. Yeah, he's clearly uncomfortable. I know, uh, Senator Kennedy. He's clearly uncomfortable with an unexpressed thought. Which is a very charitable way to say the guy can't shut his fucking mouth when he needs to. But anyway, so, um, the Independent Council is the guy whose job it is to just follow someone around 24 hours a day to find anything they can on him. And when they can't find something directly that's a crime, to start getting clever with how to interpret statutes in order to get the guy. Now, the reason that's relevant is because the Democrats have made it perfectly clear that they wanted special the special counsel to be exactly like the independent counsel. Uh, the complete freedom to do what he wants, however he wants, without any supervision of any kind at all, except for removal for cause. In other words, they wanted, they wanted uh, Rob Rosenstein to pretend that the special counsel statute was just the same as the independent counsel statute, notwithstanding the fact that Congress saw the error of having that statute in the first place and let the statute die. And Rosenstein quite properly said, no, I'm his boss, he reports to me, I will be managing him, he is not an independent counsel, he's a special counsel, and he will do what I tell him to do, not what you tell him to do. Thank you very much. And I was like, okay, good, good for you. But in any event, so even with it being a special counsel, not an independent counsel, the, the same problem exists, that because this has a political flavor to it, things are going to be perverted in order to get the guy who uh, you don't like. If you can't get him in a criminal trial, which they obviously had no case against Trump on any of that, and I'll justify this in the next video or so. Um, so what they wanted to do, and what was in fact done, and is now happening, is to get the Mueller report, to get Mueller to do this, uh, knowing that no charges would ever be brought, and not because he's the president, but because there aren't any crimes that he's committed, to use it as uh, political weaponry against him, which is not a proper way to use the criminal justice system. It's a compulsory process that is out of bounds for political games. Scalia mentioned this in his dissent in the Olson case. He's like, you know, it's really convenient if you can say of your opponent that not only are they incompetent or bad-intentioned or whatever it is, but in all probability criminals, which is exactly what you're going to get. Now, with, re with the release of the Mueller report, it seems as if, though, he didn't release it at all, because there's, no, there's not much of a correspondence between what he said in that report and what he did in that report and what Democrats want to talk about. It's almost as if he said, ah, oh, there is collusion, or ah, oh, there is this, or ah, oh, I'm sorry, not collusion, obstruction of justice, when, exactly, when that exactly was not said. Um, so it, it's uh, another example of this is when Mueller was giving his press conference, this is a real quick Mueller thing, uh, he, said, he said something, uh, there's a really subtle phrase in there, but if you were paying attention you would have noticed it, and you know that he, he fired a warning shot across the bow of, of Congress creatures not to mess with them because it, it would blow up in their faces. Now, I was reading articles about his press conference after the press conference, obviously not before the press conference, and I saw, uh, it was on 538, uh, the woman who was writing it, or the man who was writing it, used to be a, Cos a writer for Cosmo, which is where this person should go back to, because he or she is uh, profoundly dishonest and 100% inept at writing, They're just a complete idiot. And it said that the, the Mueller uh, press conference was, a, he, in it he subtly, subtly rebuked uh, Attorney General uh, Bill Barr. And I was like, well, this has to be the most subtle of subtlest subtleties that's ever subtled its way into existence because he said exactly the opposite explicitly. I'm like, this is a very subtle way to do it. And, you know, you don't, this isn't reading between the lines to get the meaning. This is reading between the lines 10 pages deep, you know, to get the trace of something. And, and the, the warning was this, and I'm paraphrasing it, the exact words I don't remember. 
and it was, it is not to be doubted that at all times, with respect to the special counsel's office's work report, uh, all that, it is not to be doubted that Bill Barr behaved perfectly, appropriately, the entire time. He acted in utter good faith, absolutely, in, in every respect. That's a warning to the, the uh, Democrats. Don't subpoena me. It's not going to go well for you. He also sent a warning to the Republicans, but I think they're less likely to want to subpoena him. But anyway, so, you know, he's making it perfectly clear that uh, there's going to be some pain there if they try to, to get him into the Congress and use him to spout the same lies they've been spouting in public because he's not going to stand for it if they do it. He's going to tell them, no, I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, uh, so from his saying, Bill Barr has behaved perfectly appropriately in every respect the whole time. Democrats managed to, to read from that that he's subtly saying Bill Barr behaved in bad faith somewhere. It, it's, it's weird. It's like it's a complete inversion. But in any event, uh, Rudy Giuliani would get up and talk you know, for the president because he's, he's the president's lawyer and obviously his job is to you know, put the best possible light on everything for his client. But, I mean, you got to represent them zealously everywhere you go. That's, that's what they get paid to do. But you know, that's just the job of the lawyer. I'm not, I'm, you know, if you're going to go into law and have clients, that's the thing you're going to have to do. But uh, he talked a lot about a perjury trap and why he wanted to keep Clint, uh, sorry, Trump out of, I, I did say Clinton, I meant Trump out of uh, having an interview with Bob Mueller, and uh, you know he talked about in, during the Clinton days that Clinton's lawyers dramatically failed him, and you would hear constantly, you know, in all the left wing media about you know, what do you have to be afraid of if if you're going to tell the truth, you have nothing to fear. There's no perjury trap if you're going to be honest. That is absolutely Soviet Union style. You know, you got to confess. It, it, why won't you come? What do you have to hide? Why won't you let us search your home? What are you hiding? Uh, it, it's just, it's gibberish. You do absolutely have something to fear with an independent counsel and a special counsel because they have been appointed just for you. Their job is to, uh, like I said, the special counsel is not quite like the independent counsel, but it's, it still has that same flavor. It has that political element to it where their job is to try to get you, you know, the top guy. And if you can't get them in a criminal trial, then you use all that compulsory process to get uh, political fodder for an impeachment, which is what the Democrats are leaning to do. So with Clinton, um, if you were alive at the time and you remember that, you know, oh, what, what depends on what is, is, and getting a blowjob isn't sexual relations and all the jokes, they were funny. But they, uh, they are told by people uh, who had not paid attention to what was going on or the people who find it politically useful to pretend like the people who haven't read what was going on are actually talking sensibly. So what were the articles, you know, there are four articles of impeachment that were considered for Bill Clinton. Two of them are rejected, uh, which is saying something that um, even the Republicans in the House who bent over backwards to concoct uh, things to, to uh, get him for, they're like, yeah, even we can't go that far. Sorry, you know, like a whole bunch of them voted against it. And that was for lying in the Paula Jones' deposition, which he didn't do, and abusing his power, which he also didn't do. So they brought two articles, uh, allegedly uh, for perjury in the grand jury and obstruction of justice. And if you read through the counts in those articles, you will find that Bill Clinton was being impeached for things that Bill Clinton didn't say. Uh, he was being impeached for perjury for things that Bill Clinton did not say. And I don't mean like, if you interpret it one way, it's the truth. If you interpret it another way, it's not the truth. Uh, you know, so you know, when when Bill said it this way, uh, it could be false. So we can't impeach. This is stuff he didn't even say. He was being impeached explicitly. It's one right there in the articles for things that people not named Bill Clinton said, which Bill Clinton did not go out in public and correct. And they said because of that, he's guilty of perjury. Square that if you can. You know, beat that beat that with a stick. So you absolutely have something to fear from. Uh, the special counsels and independent counsels when you're a political actor and they've been appointed to go after you. Uh, because you had Ken Starr, in, in the impeachment proceedings, there were there were a couple of people who should have been impeached. None of, them, none of them was named Bill Clinton. The judge who presided over the Paula Jones case should have been impeached and removed. Uh, she was thoroughly corrupt or, or maliciously incompetent. I mean, you can't be that stupid accidentally and you know, make your way into the federal judiciary. 
she should have been impeached, and so should so too should some of the people in the independent counsel's office, to include Ken Starr himself, but certainly Mr. Bittman. Uh, they were using, and uh, this would be the same would be true if they went after Trump in this way, if he'd sat down with them. Uh, every dirty trick in the book, uh, mischaracterizing the testimony right there before his the Bill Clinton's face to the grand jury. Uh, one of the one of the questions was about uh, the gifts that he had given Monica Lewinsky, and her having been uh, her having been uh, her having received a subpoena for the said gifts. And he said, "I told her uh, if they subpoena you for these gifts, you have to give them the gifts that you have. You have to give them what's in your possession." Instantly, Bittman turns around and goes, so you're now testifying, Mr. President, that you said, oh, Monica, if a subpoena shows up, you have to go find all of the gifts that I gave you and produce them. And Clinton says, I'm not going to respond to your characterization. I'm just going to I'm going to just restate what I said. I told her whatever gifts she had in her possession, if she were subpoenaed, she would have to turn them over. Uh, she obviously couldn't go collect all of them anyway, because one of them was apparently some some uh, chocolates that uh at least that's the the claim of the independent council. Um, all all manner of dirty tricks, just doing just blatantly lying about what the man just said, and then you know tacking the inflection at the end so it sounds like a question as opposed to an accusation, which is what it was. Um, when you go read through the articles of impeachment, um, as I mentioned, he was being he was being impeached for perjury for things that he didn't actually say. Uh, things uh, in the Paula Jones suit, uh, for example, his attorney at some point when he was being pressed on something, uh, he said, look, there is no affair going on with Monica Lewinsky. There is no sex going on with Monica Lewinsky. There is not in any shape, not in blah, blah, blah. And he said it in the present tense. There is not this thing happening. And it was perfectly true because ev everyone agrees that the affair had ended about a year before this, uh, this was going on, before this testimony was given. So it's perfectly obvious that it's, it's clear that the statement is true. It is literally true. There is not an affair going on. He didn't say there wasn't an affair. He said there isn't an affair. And uh, the Mr. Bittman, once again, a douchebag who should have been impeached and then disbarred, by the impeach removed and then disbarred, uh, when talking about it, he goes, uh, in relationship to a phrase that we all hear now that we heard back then, the president is not above the law, you know, hence the title of the video. It's true the president is not above the law, but it's also true he's not below the, below the law. In other words, there's not a special heightened level of innocence that you have to have if you're a president before you can be considered not guilty. Uh, it should just be the same no matter who you are, but not in Mr. Bittman's mind. Uh, he says, but sir, when your lawyer said that, you did not correct him. And Clinton quite properly said, uh, Mr. Bittman, he was my lawyer. I wasn't his. My job in a deposition as a witness, as a deponent, is to focus on the questions I'm given and answer only those questions that I'm given. Nothing else. That's my job. In fact, when if you get deposed, they will tell you this. You should answer the questions that, uh, that I ask you. Don't answer questions I haven't asked you. They're trying to lay a foundation. They're going to go through, and if there's anything that's been missed, your lawyer can pick it up on the back end. Uh, so if you're in a deposition and the question is put to you, do you know what day of the week it is? The correct answer is not Wednesday, if it is Wednesday. The correct answer is, yes, I do know what day of the week it is, or no, I do not know what the day of the week what day of the week it is. And if you do know what the day of the week is, the lawyer's job then is to ask the follow-up, what day of the week is it? And then you tell them, it's Wednesday, if it is Wednesday. Uh, but if the lawyer doesn't ask the follow-up, that's not your fault, as Clinton quite properly pointed out in the grand jury. He says, Mr. Bittman, you seem to be doing an awful lot of whining that I didn't do the Jones lawyers' work for them. It's not my fault they don't know how to ask a follow-up question, but, you know, that's, their, it, you know, that's them. Uh, I'm not responsible for what they said. I'm not responsible for what anybody else in there said. I was following the rules I was given, the instructions I was given, and doing exactly what I was told I was supposed to do in that deposition. He says, but sir, Mr. President, you are the President of the United States. Don't you feel that you have a special obligation, a special duty to correct inaccuracies in the record. And Clinton says, well, first of all, it's not inaccurate. It was, it's quite true that I was not having an affair at the time. And uh, Mr. Bitten says, oh, so what are, you, what are you trying to say? That because you weren't actually having sex in front of the judge, that uh, it was true? And Clinton says, no, I'm not trying to be cute, counsel. Uh, 
I mean that at that time, and for, I don't know, uh, many months, maybe a year beforehand, uh, the relationship had ended. It was quite true what my lawyer said, but I wasn't paying attention to what he said. The lawyers were bickering with themselves and the judge. I'm focused on my question, the pending question to me. And uh, he, you know, he's got this document and he says, you know, I'm, I'm paying attention to what's on here that I'm being asked about. And that's, that's my job. Everything else is between the rest of the people. Uh, but that notion that there's a special uh, legal duty of presidents or politicians to, no, there isn't. There might be the expectation politically that uh, people would like it if presidents are very forthcoming or whatever. But that's not a legal duty. That is simply what people would prefer. He has no different obligation in any deposition than anybody else. Uh, tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, which has been interpreted in the courts since time immemorial to mean you just have to truthfully answer the question that you're actually asked. You don't have to volunteer any extra information, and you don't have to do the lawyer, the job of the lawyer who's questioning you. That is the lawyer's obligation to do the follow-up questions step by step by step to draw things out. If the lawyer drops the ball, it's not the problem of the deponent for failing to say, hey, counsel on the other side who's trying to get me. You really missed a good line that you could have stuck it to me with. Literally, let me tell you what it is. And that's what Bitten was saying. And that's one of the things that they were saying is, is proof of the perjury. That his lawyer said something, which was literally true. And you go through and look at uh, the articles of impeachment. Uh, they're talking about gifts that Bill Clinton gave Monica Lewinsky. And it was asked about in the Jones deposition. And they're going through and asking, and he's, uh, you know, have you ever given her gifts? And he says, yes. Do you know where they are? I don't remember all of it. Uh, I, gave her this, I gave her a Walt Whitman book. I gave her this. And what about a, a, a pen or a brooch? He's like, I don't know. Maybe. I don't, don't recall. What about a necktie? Maybe. I, I, I don't know. I give up. He's like, I get and give hundreds of gifts every year. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you everything I gave her. Uh, he says, I, I had gone out shopping. I had a big bag full of stuff. I gave it to the secretary to parcel out, and uh, you know I put some stuff in there for you know what I was going to give. Put some, got some stuff together, gave it to Monica, and sent her on her way. You know, I don't know what all is there. And and to give you an idea of how petty the uh, the independent counsel's office was, actually without even stating what they said, let me just give you a, a random example from the real world. Suppose I give you a Christmas a Christmas gift. Or a birthday gift, something of that type, and I wrap it in a really nice packaging of some type, and then I give it to you, and you open it, and inside there is a gift, and you say thank you, and then you tell someone, so and so gave me a gift, and then they turn around and accuse you of perjury because you failed to say when you said that you were given a gift that you were also given wrapping paper. He gave you, which it's literally true. I mean, when you give someone a gift and wrapping paper, you're giving them the gift the bow, the wrapping paper, and the card attached to it, but nobody thinks that. When, when you go get takeout, no one thinks that, oh, you got takeout and a takeout container. Woo! These people are really generous. They give you the, the container for free. How generous of... No, it's just, that's what you stick it in. And so when they're grilling Clinton on the gifts, uh, the independent counsel asks, didn't you give her a bag? And Clinton's like, I had the gifts in the bag that I gave and then, you know, that was what carried the stuff that I handed to her. The bag wasn't a gift. It's just this, it's the thing that carried the gifts. He's like, but, it, but you did give her a bag. And he's like, yes, I gave Monica Lewinsky a bag. It had all the gifts in it. And, and so they're trying to, like, catch him out for, you know, lying about that because he failed to state that when he gave her the gifts, they were in a bag. And, but you gave her a bag. Anyway, it's, that's just the kind of stuff they were doing. And much worse than that, normally people don't get a lawyer uh, with them when they go to the um, or testify before a grand jury, but it's a good thing Clinton did because he almost got tricked into uh, into uh, waiving inadvertently his attorney-client privilege because of a very shady uh, line of questioning that the independent counsel staff went through, asking him um, about things that his lawyer may or may not have been thinking, things that his lawyer may or may not have known. And then, uh, you know, letting that sit for a minute and then you go, well, by the way, had you mentioned the, uh, you know, um, something about the affair, you know, had, had you told your lawyer this? But they you know, didn't say it quite like that. And Clinton started to answer and his lawyer popped up. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no I'm going to object to any attempt 
to try to backdoor your way into attorney-client privilege. That is off-limits. And not only is it off-limits, that should have been a disbarment right there. It is absolutely never acceptable to try to penetrate these various privileges that people have. Uh, they're there for a reason. It might be convenient in the instant case to do that, but the privileges are there uh, not for the convenience of the prosecution. In fact, all of the rights in the Constitution that a person has, the, uh, and all of our common law rights, are there not for the convenience of the prosecutor. They're there to frustrate the prosecutor. It's to empower the criminal defendant to take the legs out from under a prosecutor and tell him to go the hell away. Shoo! Uh, I don't have to answer your question. I don't have to do this. You can't make me do that. I insist on this. I have an entitlement to it. It is absolute, and you will provide it. Uh, anyway, it, it, it is absolute. When I, when I would do interviews, interrogations, uh, <clears throat> I would never attempt under any circumstances to try to get around a privilege that a person had, whether it be patient, uh, doctor patient, priest penitent, attorney client, spousal privilege. Those, I respect those privileges absolutely. They are there for a reason. Um, and you, it's just not acceptable to try to get around them. In, it's no more acceptable to try to get around those than it is a person's right to a jury trial, a right to have counsel, or any of these other things. They're there for a reason, and it's not for the convenience of law enforcement. Find another way to get the information you need, or go the hell away. Uh, your problems as an investigator are your problems, not the, uh, the person you're interrogating's problems. Uh, but anyway, they were doing all this, this kind of, it's using kind of like the read method of interrogation, which I never would use. Uh, it, it, because what, what it does is um, one of the problems with a lot of interrogation techniques is they're designed to put a person on their back foot to trip them up to get something to use against them or to put them in an emotional state where they lose their cool and overspeak or underspeak because then you can say, oh, well, you know, you did speak, you said that's not entirely true. You were exaggerating and an exaggeration, perjury. And remember, this is in a, the context of a situation in which they were actually charging him with perjury for things for, for false state, allegedly false statements he didn't make. They're trying to charging him for perjury for true statements that someone else made. And so Giuliani would point out, the perjury trap is this. It's not what you say that matters. It's what someone else says. If your testimony is inconsistent with another person's testimony, the prosecutor is going to do what he needs to do, which is to say, I will believe the other person's claim to be the true one, and therefore yours is the false one, and you knew it to be false. And if you look in the news, for any of the disagreements between like what McGahn said and the president said, they say they accuse Trump of, well, that he's lying. Trump is the one who's lying. It's not that McGahn is wrong. McGahn is absolutely perfectly correct on everything, and Trump is just lying. This notwithstanding the fact that the, the distinction that was being drawn between the president and McGahn with respect to what was being said about firing uh, special counsel is the use of the word firing. Uh, president, I did not say, I did not say, go fire him, uh, which, you know, may or may not be true. I don't know. I wasn't there. He might have said, get rid of them, but he did. He's like, I did not say, I did not utter the word fire once, which is what the accusation, because there was a quotation around it. He's like, I did that is not a quotation. And of course they say, well, no, McGann is perfect. His, his he never makes mistakes. Uh, it's absolutely gospel truth. It has to be a hundred percent true. You know, it can't be any other possible way. Therefore the president is lying. And that is the shtick of every Congress critter, all the people in left-wing media, the pundits. You know, it, it, that's just the way it's got to be. Uh, it can't be any other. It can't conceivably be anything else. And that's one of the problems with. That's why Giuliani was smart to keep his clients, particularly his client. <laughs> let's be frank, out of uh, having to testify, um, because Trump does tend to exaggerate, and that might work okay in some contexts, but not when you know you're sitting down in front of someone who's who you have an illegal obligation, if you answer, to answer uh, truthfully without, uh, you know, all of the embellishments. You, you've got to be really, really, uh, well, honest. And um, <laughs> it doesn't strike me as one of Trump's strong suits. But he is a politician, so it doesn't strike me as any of their strong suits. But in any, in any event, Giuliani was absolutely correct to keep Trump out. Clinton's lawyer should have kept him, uh, should have protected him. But his lawyer, but Trump should have sued, I'm sorry, Clinton should have sued him for malpractice, quite frankly. But the thing, uh, when they're going through this this uh, colloquy with Bill Clinton, uh, <clears throat> I was talking about what what uh, it depends on what is means. If is means 
you know, present tense, then it's true. If is means present and past tense, then it would be false. I take it to mean present tense. When someone asks me, are you doing X? I don't take them to be saying, are you now or have you ever done X? If they want to know if I've in the past done X, they should ask that follow-up question. And so here's the thing with uh, the Monica Lewinsky when he got, uh, you know, uh, ambushed with that, with that line of questions and the Jones uh, matter. The uh, people were talking, they, they would talk about how it's disingenuous for him to talk about how getting a blowjob is not sexual uh, relations, but giving one would be. This is not something that Bill Clinton cooked up. This is not something his legal team cooked up. This is something the judge cooked up. Not why I'm saying she should, she is a person who should have been impeached and removed because she was thoroughly misbehaving. There was a series of definitions that were trotted out for what sex, sex uh, sexual relations, and blah, 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 what all these things, different things mean. Clinton's team objected to all of those because they were just wacky. Uh, and the judge says, no, 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 we're going to go with definition number one, which allows for the state of affairs that if the deponent, the person who is swear, you know, who's being interviewed, uh, has something done to him, it doesn't count as sexual relations. It only counts as sexual relations if he does it to another person or has a third party do it to another person, causes another person to do it to yet another person. So if you have two people, A and B, if A gives a blowjob to B, B has not engaged in sexual relations, but A has. If B uh, tells someone to, uh, tell, to make A, to have A perform a sex act on someone who isn't B, that is also sexual relations. Uh, so anyway, it, it, it is a really, really convoluted uh, definition. It's deliberately obscure, precisely to lay a trap for him. Uh, and so the Republican judge, you know, oh, I know what's going on here. I'm going to cooperate. And then she's, remember, she's the one who held him in contempt of court for lying. And in her order, finding him in contempt of court, and she said, I find that he deliberately lied, comma, the torturous definition and, and mass and, and I think it was confusion or debate over what it means, something along the anyway, the, the the lack of clarity and what it was we were talking about. Those facts notwithstanding, he clearly lied. Now, on that point, even the Republicans in the House were like, yeah, uh, no, um, not going to vote for an article of impeachment for that, that line. Uh, this definition, no, that doesn't work for us. We're not dealing with that. But they, uh, there was a, a line of questioning in the Jones matter where uh, the lady, the lawyer asked Clinton if he had an affair with, a sexual affair with Monica Lewinsky. Uh, and the, so there's a real quick back and forth there, and his lawyer interrupts after he has said no, uh, because the lawyer questioning him said, and by, I, I said sexual affair, by which I mean sexual relations. Uh, as defined in clause one of the definition that the judge has given us. And that's when his lawyer interrupts and says, we need to get the definition back out so he can look at it to make sure we don't miss anything because it's really convoluted. And so uh, in the grand jury testimony, he says, well, Mr. Bittman, or I don't, I don't think it was Bittman at that point. He says, I do remember this line of questioning. And he says, in fact, if you look at this exhibit, which was the, the, different, the definition at issue, he goes, you'll notice I circled the first definition says, because that was the one the judge gave me. I didn't agree with it, but it's the one she said I was stuck with for these terms. It's the one I had to respond with respect to which, and because the judge ordered me to do it only with respect to that definition, those are the answers I had to give. And if you read it, it is very clear that if the deponent has this action or that action performed on him or her uh, or is touched sexually in somewhere that is not one of the enumerated places, it is not sexual relations, by the definition, the, George, the judge forced me to accept. He goes, and I circled it. See? And that's when uh, Bittman's trying to get him on the, but don't you have a special obligation? No, I don't have a special obligation. I'm the deponent. I'm the witness. My job is to hear a question and respond to it. And uh, so anyway, th this uh, that whole thing with Bill Clinton uh, is exactly what is in store for Trump or would be in store for Trump if he had testified. And it seems to be that it's going to be what's in store for him now if the Democrats banging the impeachment drum get their way. 
It is simply the hijacking of the criminal justice system so the way they can have compulsory process uh, to abuse for a political end. The Republicans were wrong when they did it to Clinton, and the Democrats are wrong for what they're going to, what they've been doing and are going to do uh, to Donald Trump. It is not a legitimate use of the grand jury. It's not a le legitimate use of compulsory process. And I have I've watched all the hearings in both houses on all matters related to Trump. Uh, I've, I've watched all of them. And in there, I have heard from lawyers, Democrat lawyers, including, uh, anyway, uh, Nadler, uh, you know, big pile of Schiff, incidentally. Uh, the impeachment thing did not work out well for the Republicans. For the first time in 176 years, in the second, in the sixth year of a presidency, the office, I'm sorry, the, the party that was in the White House picked up seats because the opposition party lost them. It was the first time uh, since 1822 that, it, that that had happened. A lot of people, or not a lot of people, some people on the left are telling the Democrats, don't worry about it, nothing really bad happened to the Republicans. They lost their leadership. Newt Gingrich out. The guy that replaced Newt Gingrich out. Um, the ironic one, because uh, one of the biggest bangers on the drum of impeachment is Adam Schiff, whose memory must be as long as, a, as, as uh, good as a goldfish's memory. The only reason he got his seat, the only reason that he won, is because the guy he was campaigning against was one of the impeachment bang drum, uh, drum bangers for Clinton. He was one of the, the managers, one of the prosecutors in, uh, from the House who was going to be taking it to the Senate. That guy lost his seat to Adam Schiff. So Adam Schiff should be very careful about wanting to do the impeachment thing because he, of all people, is the guy who occupies a seat, which he got only because he was able to successfully point out the corruption of the opposition party with respect to the, the impeachment of this president uh, for you know all these different kinds of nonsensical things. So be very careful. It did not work out well for the Republicans. Democrats, it's not going to work out well for you. And the reason for it is this. It's not because we Americans want corrupt presidents or anything of, the, of that type. It's that the the uh, high crimes and misdemeanors, the impeachment, the removing from office, the attempt to remove from office a duly elected president for something that is not a very pressing issue is something that the American people don't like. When you have to go through these convoluted steps, uh, these, fi these highly reticulated convolutions in order to arrive at, well, we'll impeach him for something that someone else said, and we'll just blame him for what other people say. People didn't like that. Uh, now, it did not wipe the Republicans from power, but it did greatly weaken them, and it knocked out a lot of their heavy hitters. Uh, they lost four Senate seats, which is uh, not, you, know, you don't, he, they didn't have them to lose, so, you know, they were able to retain their majority, I think, by one seat. Uh, the House managers had problems, some of them had to go away, uh, some of them decided, oh, I'll ride this, I'll ride this to a Senate seat, and they didn't. Uh, Gingrich was predicting that he would get uh, p the House would pick up 30, perhaps 40 seats because of the righteousness of their going after this guy who got a blow job and lied about it thing. And uh, not only did he not get 30 seats or 40 seats, uh, he lost seats in the House. And he wound up uh, resigning in disgrace. The next guy wound up resigning, resigning in disgrace. It was, there was a common theme there. Uh, but it was wrong when they did it, and it's going to be wrong now. It's wrong now if the Democrats uh, go pull go pull the stuff. Now, on the subject of um, the president has com committed impeachable offenses, this statement is true, but uh, it is gibberish to say it. And the reason for that is that everything is an impeachable offense. And the reason for that is because of our history. The term high crimes and misdemeanors is a term of art. It's a legal term of art that goes back into the mists of history. And we're a common law country. The, the framers of the Constitution, when they wrote it, the founders, when they wrote, when they framed the Constitution, just picked up the common law as it was, except for such modifications to it as they wished to make. Take uh, the way the treason bit is, is uh, worded. It doesn't just say, uh, you know, treason, a uh, person shall suffer death. It says, treason is the following acts. You have to do this, it has to be that, and here's the level, here's how it has to, it either has to be admitted in open court, or it has to be testified to by, I think, two independent witnesses to the same uh, allegedly treasonous act, okay? And the reason for that is that the common law definition, the from, picked up from England, 
the definition of treason was not simply uh, aid and comfort to the enemy. Having sex with the with the queen, if you weren't the king, treason. You know, you could get killed for that. <laughs> Execution, because that's that was high treason. So they said, yeah, we can't have that. Uh, if you if you bang the president's wife, we're not going to kill you for it. That's not treason. So they they picked up the bulk of the concept of treason uh, and made it clear that the warlike aspects of it, things that hurt the nation, are what they want to go after, not uh, petty things like you know, adultery. With high crimes and misdemeanors, that's not true. They picked it up wholesale from history. And here are things that have qualified as high crimes and misdemeanors. My favorite one is that a man was uh, impeached for returning to the treasury unspent uh, appropriations. Ret I'm sorry, yeah, returning to Parliament, uh, the, the Treasury, funds that had not been spent, which had been appropriated to be spent. In other words, being fiscally responsible was a, an impeachable offense. Other things that are impeachable offenses, having incompetent uh, associates or subordinates. Okay, uh, so if you hire somebody and they turn out to be incompetent, that could be impeachable if, if you know, if that's what the, the Parliament wanted to do. So everything, even you know, uh, being fiscally responsible, not wasting tax dollars, that can be impeachable. And, and the reason for it is, and this, this is about on the Federalist Papers, these offenses that are uh, covered by high crimes and misdemeanors do not deal with law at all. They deal with political matters. So anything, so what, what qualifies as an impeachable offense is, it can be anything, but the, the practical thing is, it's whatever the majority in the House of Representatives is willing uh, to go after. It's, it's the thing that they think is sufficiently important for them to get the next bad election result, uh, for them to lose, to surrender uh, virtually entirely their uh, legislative agenda. Uh, when impeachment's going on, uh, not a lot's going to be happening. Uh, particularly once it goes over to the Senate, it is a privileged matter. It takes precedence over all other matters. Uh, to include budgets, war, it, you know, unless Congress is going to do something uh, to stop the impeachment as it's going on, once it gets there, that, uh, you know, once the trial starts, that is it. Nothing else interferes with it. Uh, I, I presume that an, attack, an invasion would, but uh, who knows. So anyway, it's a privileged matter. It takes precedence over all other matters. Uh, the hearings that you're going to have and blah, 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 it's going to eat up your news cycle. Uh, you can look at the Democrats now. They've not gotten one. They've gotten one major piece of legislation signed, which the president wanted. So that's not really you know, a great deal. You know, every they, they've introduced three thousand bills, and uh, they've gotten like ten or eleven passed. Almost all of them are trivial, like renaming a post office, and, and uh, where they're going to sort out the proper pay rate for. I think it was podiatrists in the VA system. You know, it, not really burning legislation. These are really, really uh, trivial affairs. That's what they've been able to get through because they're interested in going after this president and they have lost their entire legislative agenda. They're getting absolutely nothing done. And if you think it's bad now, wait till you actually start doing impeachment. You ain't getting shit done and you're going to get the bad results in the next election because you're going after him for something that's petty. Uh, so yes, the House of Representatives can impeach for anything they have the political will that they're willing to spend the political capital to go after. And if it is something trivial, like in the Bill Clinton case, it's not going to work out well for you. When, when 176 years of history, what happens hadn't happened to your party when you're the, and, and, uh, the opposition happens to you, uh, you, should, you should think very carefully. Uh, future Congresses should look back at the history and think very carefully. This is not something to go after. The polls are clear. The majority of Americans do not want, they're tired of this. They want it to go the hell away. The report is out. There wasn't collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Uh, stop it. You are trying to gen into existence uh, things to go after the president for because you're unwilling to say that as the House of Representatives, we can impeach for anything that we want, which is just say we think the president's a big poopy head. And we want to get rid of the Mr. Poopy Head in the office. We don't like his ties. We don't like the fact that sometimes when he doesn't have enough water when he's talking, his speech kind of slurs and he says, United States, you know, is that his attention? We don't like that, so we want to impeach him. They don't want to do that. They, they want the veneer, the thinnest patina of cover by a, uh, an investigation, which is what they got, but they didn't like the results. Now they're pretending that the results are completely contrary to what they are. And uh, 
I'll talk more about that in a future video. Other than that, on the impeachment bit, impeachment bit with respect to Bill Clinton and history and the cautionary tell that it should serve as, but doesn't seem to be doing, uh, that's all I have to say on uh, in this video. Have a great day.